speaker is Lauren Book. She will be opening this symposium. Um, she has been abused as a child by her nanny, and she has used her own experiences to start her organization, Lauren's Kids, in the US. Her organization educates adults and children about sexual abuse, and the ultimate goal is to prevent sexual abuse through awareness and education and to help victims heal with guidance and support. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for coming all the way from the US to tell us your story, and we're looking forward to hearing it. Good morning, everybody. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, as Laura said, my name is Lauren Book, and my Dutch is rather rusty, so I'm going to do this in English. So I'll um, so pardon me. I try to throw some some Dutch in in my speech today. Um, I am honored to be addressing you today um, at the invitation of your national reporter, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the Crime Stoppers International Conference last fall in Barbados. It truly was wonderful meeting you and to really get to, to know um, what an incredible leader that you have here. Um, it was once said, give light and the darkness will disappear of itself, said Dutch philosopher Erasmus more than 500 years ago. And I want to try and think about that imagery, bringing light to dark places. That is what we're doing here today and I'm very excited to be here. This is a historic moment for Holland. Your country is taking a step out of darkness into light with the release of yesterday's report, a first of its kind in the Netherlands. To give you a little bit of background about me before I talk about my story, I've been working for more than a decade to prevent abuse, heal survivors, and help give a voice to more than 42 million survivors in the, of sexual abuse in the United States today. I've advocated for the passage of two dozen state and national laws to protect children. I've worked to create an abuse prevention curriculum educating thousands of children throughout the US. During the past five years, I've walked nearly 10,000 kilometers, which is 6,000 miles, to raise awareness to empower survivors and educate communities. I visited countless prisons, civil commitment centers, spent hours with predators and experts to understand all sides of this very complex issue. As the founder and CEO of the Lawrence Kids Foundation, I work each and every day from a place of power, light, and knowledge to combat the sexual abuse and exploitation of children throughout the world. But 18 years ago, my story was much different. I was, I am the one in three represented in your report. To understand my story of abuse, you have to go back to a time when I was 10 years old and understand my family dynamic. My mom was bipolar and schizophrenic my dad is a lawyer lobbyist in Florida and traveled three months out of the year. He wasn't home. And so we always had nannies, babysitters, to care for us. I have a sister who's two years younger than myself and a brother who is seven years younger than me. And at the time, I was 10 years old and very happy and content taking care of my siblings and our home, except I couldn't really drive to get to school at 10. So we had to have somebody in our home taking care of us. And so we had people revolving in and out. And as so many of you know, the most important thing children need are consistency and love. And we had a lot of love in our house, but the consistency was lacking. And so one day in August, Waldina Flores was her name, came into our home. She had references and background checks. And when she got, got to the house, I hated having her there. I liked taking care of my siblings, and it made me fit and feel whole in my family, albeit very broken, a very broken and violent home. And so Waldina came in and began what was the grooming process, what we know of today. She was building trust 
with me and my parents. She let me stay up late, later than my sister and my brother. I got extra dessert, which, had I known about Stroopwafels at the time, would have been Stroopwafels. Um, but I got all of these great things that I thought I was getting more attention, more love, more of what I needed. All the while, she was building that trusting relationship so she could begin her abuse. She came in August. By December, we were standing in my mom's chocolate store working for the holidays, and I was chewing my gum like a cow. Um, I was very nervous and chewing away, and she said, stop chewing your gum that way. And as a sassy, then 11-year-old, I said, what are you going to do about it? And she said, well, I'll show you what I'm going to do about it. And she proceeded to stick her tongue in my mouth and take the gum out of my mouth with her tongue. And that was the first overt sexual encounter that we had. And when she realized that I did not go tell a parent, that I didn't tell a teacher, that I didn't tell a grown-up buddy, she had me. Hook, line, and sinker. And I was never going to tell anyone. Because these individuals thrive in the darkness. And so my abuse began. Six very, very, very long years of physical abuse, torture, sexual abuse, and torture, and emotional abuse. At one point, I was thrown down a flight of stairs and urinated and defecated on as a means to control me and what was happening in our home. I was abused 365 days a year, seven days a week. There was no breaks. There was no time off. Oftentimes, while my parents were in the very next room, I could have called out. I could have screamed, but I knew better. And Waldi was smart. She never hit me where people would look. They weren't doing random body checks at this point when I was 13, 14, 15, or 16. Eventually, my parents, thinking that something was off because I wasn't allowed to have any friends, I wasn't allowed to leave my home, they talked to Waldi because, again, they thought they could trust her. They knew they could trust her. And so she decided that I needed to go start dating. So I went out with a young man who saw some of those bruises and started asking questions. Eventually, I shared what was going on with him. But after my disclosure to a counselor, my road um, was not super light as we talk about darkness and light. The recovery process was very, very difficult. One that I almost did not survive. Once I disclosed in Waldi, we began the legal process and um, I started dealing with anorexia, self-mutilation. My body dropped down to 70 pounds I lost almost all of my hair. My organs were shutting down. I was in a hospital for some time. I remember sitting on my bed one day after school, crying, 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 again. And my mom came into my room. And she said, Lauren, I don't know why you're still crying. You should be over this by now. Look at me. It happened to me, and I'm fine. And I said to myself in that moment, while I love my mom, she is anything but fine. And I will do what I have to do for the rest of my life to heal myself and help others heal and thrive and survive. Now, from that time, thank you, thank you. From that time, I took four steps forward and eight steps back, but little by little, day by day, 
with family and support, we got there. Through recovery, I learned that 95% of sexual abuse is preventable with education and awareness. And so I decided to take my pain and my darkness and make it different for others, to shine light so they would not have to suffer the way that I did and so many others have, but no child should. Now let's go back to that. 95% of abuse is preventable through education and awareness. These are two pieces to keep in mind as you work through the findings in your report. Let's look at education. As a former classroom teacher, I worked with a developmental psychologist to create an in-school curriculum, um, abuse prevention curriculum called Safer Smarter Kids. It works to empower children to be the first line of defense in their own safety so that they know it's okay to tell. We use our safety stop sign and our trusted triangle to access help. It's being taught in over 16,000 classrooms throughout the state of Florida and throughout the country. We truly are making waves. We've also retrofitted that population for foster children in the system and for children with developmental delays or disabilities because 90% of that population may be sexually abused at some point in time in their life. Only one to 3% of those cases will ever be brought to light. And 49% of those children will be abused 10 or more times in their life. Those are incredible statistics. But it's not just about educating our children. We need to create a culture shift. This is where education and awareness go hand in hand. We need to educate teachers, parents, communities, making them aware of the signs of abuse, traps that predators set, and how to report suspected child abuse. We've so successfully launched multiple campaigns, this one being our Don't Miss the Signs campaign, where we educate people throughout Florida, not just about the signs that you need to look for within your children from birth through high school, but also looking for, looking for signs for individuals who seek to harm our children, which is very important. But my favorite awareness campaign is our, is our 1,500 mile, which is 2,500 kilometer walk, um, through Florida. We zigzag from coast to coast. We walk for hope and healing. We walk for recovery. We walk for the 42 million survivors, family members of childhood sexual abuse with the message that it is okay to tell. We've walked with over 10,000 Floridians each year to advocate for legislative change. We walk to ignite a flame and much like your, your um, pictures here today, we wanted to bring the voices of survivors that were silenced far too long. So we used the hashtag, why I walk. I met children, family members, a woman whose husband was sexually assaulting their child. And that little block brings so much power to those survivors. And so that was one of my favorites and always will be. In addition to awareness and education, there's one more piece that is important not to miss. And that is the creators of darkness, those who thrive in the shadows of secrecy, child predators like Waldi. I visited civil commitment centers where we keep our most dangerous sexually violent predators in the state of Florida. They spend their lives there. I've spoken with expert clinicians and the predators themselves. I am told time and time again, there is no cure for pedophilia. We can try to manage triggers, but these individuals are hardwired to offend. According to the US FBI, 
the average child predator will assault as many as 117 children before they are caught. Waldi, my nanny, once I disclosed, fled to Oklahoma, where she was found coaching 10-year-old girls in soccer, setting herself up, grooming her next victim. So what do we do with this information? Because I can't leave you in the darkness. What you've done with this report, you've done the research. You know the facts. We've heard voices from all facets of the issue, victims, experts, predators, law enforcement. We know there is no cure for pedophilia. We know these individuals seek to harm our children and will reoffend when given the chance. We know, according to your report, at least one in three Dutch children will be sexually assaulted before the age of 18. And we know something must be done. Thanks to the Office of the Dutch National Reporter, you have the data. Now is the time to act, to shine light where there was once darkness, to protect those most innocent among us. In addition to prevention, education, increased awareness, and access to services, I implore you to create a national registry because you have a right to know who is around your children. Parents, caregivers, teachers, community members have a responsibility to protect our children. And the only way to do this is to know the dangers that exist around the corner or right next door. As your report reveals, these predators are often much closer to home than we care to realize. Neighbors, teachers, family members, coaches, people we have come to trust. Remember, an average child predator will offend against as many as 117 children in their lifetime. We need to know who these people are. In Florida, we've gone so far as to add a designation of sexual predator to driver's licenses. We've created child safety zones. We've enacted residency restrictions to further insulate our children from child predators. In conclusion, where we are, with the publication of this report, you have ignited a flame. I urge you as a country to stand united, to use this knowledge to fan the flame. Because darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. We, you, must shine the light. From that 10-year-old girl to so many in the room here today that I see from all of the very brave pictures as you walked in. Thank you. Please, don't let the light go out. Let it shine. Thank you.